Good evening and welcome to the University of Trinidad and Tobago's panel discussion on COVID-19 vaccination. Can it mitigate children's health and well-being? My name is Sainee Gray, Senior Producer at CNT3, and I will be moderating this evening's discussion. Our panelists are Mrs. Vandana Susankar Ali. She is a clinical psychologist and the assessment manager at the Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. We have Dr. Michelle Montai, who is a clinical immunologist, Dr. Vidya Ramcharata Maharaj of the Pediatric Emergency Department at the Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex, Dr. Nicole Ramachan, immunogeneticist and associate professor of biotechnology at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, and Dr. Hazel Ann Gibbs de Pisa, who is a teacher educator and an assistant professor at the Center for Education Programs at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. We begin with a presentation from each member of the panel. And so I invite Dr. Michelle Montai, clinical immunologist, to begin. Dr. Montai. Thank you so much. I would like to particularly thank Dr. Ram Lakchan and the organizers of this COVID-19 seminar series for their kind invitation to speak to you tonight. And good evening to all our viewers. Now, today we have started to immunize our adolescents and all the parents of primary school children must be saying, well, what about our kids? So what I'm proposing to do tonight is in fact, speak to this population, the primary school kids, and bring some reassurance because little people actually battle COVID-19 a lot better than adults. So to do this, I have to start off by boring you with a little bit of detail about how SARS-CoV virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, causes infection. And of course, the first thing is somebody who is infected sneezes or coughs, and we inhale some or we, some gets into our mouth or into our eyes. And that's how the virus generally enters our bodies. And when that happens, it's worthwhile thinking about the lining or the inside of your mouth or your nose or, or, uh, as, as rather like a wall, like a brick wall. And the cells that are in that wall, the bricks are the cells that the, the virus is going to try to enter. And how the virus tries to get in is by binding to receptors, substances on the surface of these bricks or these cells that we call the ACE2 receptor. So it's important you remember that, the ACE2 receptor, and the virus binds to it, and it becomes like a drill, and they get into the cells. And we know that the Delta variant actually has more of the spike proteins, which is what binds to the receptors and allows that particular variant to enter more easily. So when the virus gets into these drills in and gets into each of these bricks or cells, if you wish, it makes hundreds and thousands of babies, which we call virions. And then when they are made, they burst through the cells, damaging them. And all of these different uh, babies now will try to infect more cells in that, in that lining or that wall. So that what we have is a constant infection and damaging of many cells. And the more cells that we damage, the more symptoms we are likely to have. For example, you will begin to have a sore throat, or you might have a fever, you might have more runny nose, you might have loss of smell, that sort of thing. But we, if we can contain the virus at this point in the upper airway, in the nose and the throat, that's all good and well. We probably would have very mild infection. But very often we can't. Or before I go there, these are millions of virions that are emerging from damaged cells. And as I said, the more cells you have, the more symptoms you get. But to come back to the story, if you are not able to control in the upper airways, the virus in the nose and the, on the back of the throat, then the virus on a lot of the babies that have been formed migrate down to the lungs. And in the lungs, what you find is that they, they, they're air sacs. They're air sacs like this, which fill with oxygen. And that's what passes from the lungs into the blood to be, to be passed to all parts of the body. But when the virus gets in, it infects the lining cells of these air sacs. And that causes the air sacs to become filled with fluids. And if it becomes filled with all of this fluid, oxygen cannot, the gases cannot get into the air sacs, and therefore we get less oxygen to pass to, to parts of the body. So you begin to get other symptoms, shortness of breath, and the oxygen in the blood drops, and you will probably have to be hospitalized and even ventilated. 
So that's sort of like a, a, a encapsulation of how the virus causes problems. And I should say that if you don't contain it in the lungs, it can pass into the blood and be passed the virus to other parts of the body to infect and, and cause damage to other um, tissues and other organs such as the heart, kidneys, et cetera. So how do, babe, how do children manage? And this is what's so interesting. Little people are actually better able to manage the virus in the upper airway, in the nose and the throat. But for one, they have low expression of this receptor, the ACE2 receptor, which the virus has to bind to, to enter cells. So that's one thing. The next thing is that they usually they have had more recently um, immunization with other, against other viruses, such as measles, mumps, and rubella. And curiously enough, when you have the MMR vaccine, it has been shown to protect against different kinds of, 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 of infections, including other virus infections. So there's a sort of protection that comes from a recent immunization with other vaccines. In addition, children get lots of coughs and colds throughout the year. And sometimes these coughs and colds are caused by other coronaviruses, rather like cousins to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID. And when that happens, that provides some protection against infection with the SARS, um, with, with the COVID-19 COVID virus. But in addition to that, even when we get down into the lungs, I know this is a rather complicated um, diagram, here too, the child or children seem to protect better. For one, the lining cells of these air sacs also express less of the ACE2, the ACE2 receptors, so less virus can get in. But also too, they don't seem to in produce an overexpression of what we call inflammation in the lungs, so that they, they also prevented from having a lot of the fluids, the protective fluids and cells come in and fill that air sac with lots of fluids. In addition, they often have a cell called eosinophils increase amounts, which we associate with allergy or we associate with worms, interestingly enough. And the presence of higher levels of this uh, cell, for reasons that we don't quite understand, seems to be protective against more severe COVID-19 infection. So little people really do have an armamentarium of ways of protecting themselves against the worst um, of COVID-19 to, to the large extent. So even in the presence of the Delta variant, which is definitely a game changer and is far more infectious and contagious, children and even adolescents um, um, can get infected quite easily with the Delta variant. But the good news is that most children have mild infections and will present with coughing, sneezing, runny nose, perhaps an upset stomach, headache, and fatigue, rather like a lot of other viral infections. But we should want to still try and protect them, despite their ability, the vast majority of them, to handle COVID-19 infection very well. And how do we provide them with this extra layer of, of protection? And the way we do this is by parents and close family members who interact with these kids regularly getting vaccinated. If they have older siblings, adolescents, get them vaccinated as well. And continue to teach our younger kids how to maintain the three Ws. Watch their distance, wash their hands frequently, and wear their masks. So that's how we provide an extra layer around them, even though they are well able to battle COVID-19 a bit better than the adult adults. But even then, children do get going to hospital with more severe forms of COVID. And from work that has been done in a number of countries and experience in a number of countries, we have found some characteristics of children who seem to have more severe COVID-19. They tend to be a bit older or very young. Uh, boys are a little bit more, um, um, tend, to, uh, tend to have a little bit more severe COVID than girls. But the key thing is many of these children who are hospitalized have pre-existing comorbidities and usually more than one. And we are talking here about the obesity, diabetes, sickle cell disease, cancer, severe forms of asthma, not most asthma, and other chronic lung disease or heart disease. So these are children who have pre-existing medical conditions. They are more likely not to deal so well with COVID and to find themselves in hospital. Um, I'm not going to speak so much to this because I know Dr. Ram Charita Maraj will speak to this, but there's another rare condition called multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children, which can occur even in healthy kids who have been exposed to COVID-19. And um, you'll hear more about this by Dr. Ram Charita Maharaj. Uh, coming back to the question of asthmatics, asthma is a common chronic condition in children in this age group. And what we have learned is that children 
who have asthma are actually are, are, are not don't have an increase. This this speaks to all the various uh, allergic rhinitis, atopic uh, uh, dermatitis, a lot of different um, allergic conditions. There's no increased risk for SARS-CoV-2 and especially severe SARS-CoV-2. So that's another good piece of, of it, news in this population. So really to summarize all of that, most children who have COVID-19 infection because of all the, way, the their ways of pro protecting themselves will more than likely have asymptomatic or mild disease even in the presence of the Delta variant. Rarely they can have this MIS-C or multi-system condition, which um, the, Dr. Ramcharita Maharaj would speak to. The other thing is that their protective mechanisms uh, depend on their um, the fact that they have had more recently childhood vaccines, their, their particular aspects of their immune system responses, and also to that they might be exposed more recently to related coronaviruses. Hospitalization, hospitalized cases tend to be those who have one or more, more other underlying con medical conditions. And the good news is most asthmatics do not seem to have any increased risk for severe forms of COVID-19 infection. So I wanna thank you for your, your attention. And I want to pass you back to our, um, the MC as it were for this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Montai, for that presentation. And of course, I want to thank, apparently, we have a lot of people viewing us um, this afternoon, and I want to invite those viewers to send in your questions. We are taking questions to the panels right after all the presentations are finished. Next up is Dr. Ramcharita Maharaj of the Pediatric Emergency Department at the Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex. Dr. Ramcharita Maharaj. Hi, good night, everybody. So thank you very much for joining us on a, a rainy um, afternoon as well. Um, so we're gonna be speaking about COVID-19, the vaccines and presentations that we do see. And first, before we actually go into the vaccines, what I wanted to do was to just look internationally and locally what's been going on with the COVID-19 infections. And as always, we'll start with the United States of America. And 18% of their COVID positive cases are children. And in the last two weeks, they have actually seen a 5% increase in the number of children who are actually testing positive for COVID. And this is all in the background of the Delta variant. So if you're having more cases that are testing positive, then your hospitalization rates are also going to go up. And presently, their hospitalization rates are 0.2% to 1.9%. Because they have a lot of different states and depending on their vaccination status, their hospitalization rate also varies. The mortality is 0 to 0.03%. If we go across to the Atlantic in the United Kingdom, you'd also observe that they're actually seeing an increase as well in the presentations, COVID positive and in the hospitals. And for the United Kingdom, the hospitalization rate is for every 100,000 positive cases of COVID, one to four children will be hospitalized. And for those hospitalized, one in 50,000 will be critically ill and require HDU ICU setting. In terms of deaths, two in one million COVID positive children. Closer to home, if we look at Brazil, since the pandemic has started, they have had over 20 million confirmed cases and just under 600,000 deaths. I was not able to divide or get the data for you to, to see with children versus adults, but looking at their entire population, their mortality is 2.69%. The last two numbers that you see on the screen is in the last week, Brazil has seen just over 200,000 new cases and just under 6,000 deaths. Trinidad and Tobago, because I know this is the data that you all would be looking at. And what you would notice is that in the COVID positive um, presentations of Trinidad and Tobago, 3.3% of those COVID positive cases are in the zero to nine year age group. In the 10 to 19 year age group, that is 10, that is 5.5%. Our mortality for the zero to nine year age group is 0%. For the 10 year to 19 year age group is 0.14%. 
and overall 0 to 19 years gives us a mortality of 0.09%. I became head of pediatric emergency department in October 2020. I will be giving you data as per my department. I'm not able to give you data in terms of national cases. But from October 2020, we had 19 cases that we transferred to the parallel system. And they were roughly equal in terms of male to female, with the females being 53%. Majority of the cases were transferred when we had our spike in May 2021. And as you can see for August so far, we've had two cases that we've transferred. Interestingly enough, just as Dr. Montai was talking about the comorbidities, 47% of the cases, just under 50% of the cases had comorbidities. And these were things like allergic rhinitis, asthma, cardiac conditions, um, dilated cardiomyopathy, diabetes. We had genetic conditions as well, chromosomal conditions, cerebral palsy. And those are some of the kids that actually um, had to go across with COVID positive and their comorbidities to be hospitalized. In terms of the age ranges, majority of them were the 11 year to 15 years, followed by the one year to five year age group, the less than one year, and the least group we transferred with the six year to 10 year age group. Small study, small amount of numbers, um, but interestingly enough, this was the age group that would have been the six year to 10 year that would have been in school and would have been exposed to the cyclical coronaviruses that Dr. Montai was speaking about in terms of how they would have also had a bit more protectivity. Post-COVID, this is what Dr. Montai was referring to when she spoke about the MISI. Now, post-COVID means that the child has had a COVID infection. It might have been mild, flu symptoms that we have seen, and then two to four weeks after, when they've cleared the virus, they're no longer COVID positive in terms of the virus shedding but the antibodies that were fighting against the, the, the soldiers that they produced to fight against a virus are now attacking the heart and attacking the brain. In terms of the heart, this is data coming from Dr. Ronan Ramrup. He is the pediatric cardiologist at Eric Williams. And this is national data in that we've had 52 cases from March, 2020. And this would include Kawasaki-like illness. And this is where the kids would present with redness to their eyes, redness to their tongue. The tongue looks, it looks like a strawberry, cracked lips, um, swelling of the palms and the soles of their feet. And MISI, which stands for the Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome in Children, affects more than just the heart. They would also affect um, the brain, affect, affect the gut system, and there'll be multiple systems involved, including the kidneys as well. Majority have stayed around the cardiac areas. And in terms of the brain, this data is coming from our pediatric neurologist, and that's Dr. Vanita Shukla. And she has actually had 21 cases in where the brain was affected and to cause inflammation of the brain lining. So, all of this talk about vaccines, and I know that's what everybody is, is, is looking at. The fact is, these are the vaccines that have trials that are going on in children. For now, Pfizer has been given the okay to vaccinate children greater than equal to 12 years of age. Moderna has just completed their trials and they're getting their data analyzed to see if they can also vaccinate for the over 12 years of age. And these two both have trials running for the six months of age and over, hopefully to give us some data on that. Johnson & Johnson have trials going on with 16 to 17 years of age. Um, and they, depending on how well that trial goes, they will then trial for the 12 to 15 years of age. Sinopharm, um, interestingly enough, is being used for the greater than three years of age. And it's presently being used in the United Arab Emirates, in China, Indonesia, Chile, and Estonia. In Indonesia, Chile, and Estonia is 12 years and up. The other countries have been used in Pfizer, including Italy has also started to introduce Moderna for their 12 to 17 years, all the data is still coming in. And United Kingdom and Paraguay are reserving right now their Pfizer for the 12 to 15 and 12 to 17 years in the groups they consider to be high risk or with comorbidities. And the children that fall into this group are the ones that have obesity, 
that have heart disease, whether it's congenital or acquired, whether they have chromosomal syndromes with it, such as Down syndrome, if they have certain neurological and developmental learning disabilities, and these would be things like cerebral palsy as well. If they have a weakened immune system, children who have diabetes don't mount a very good immune response. If there are also children who have certain blood disorders like sickle cell disease, or they have had their spleen removed for some reason, they would also have a weakened immune system. Children who have kidney problems, thyroid problems, um, as I said, diabetes with the pancreas, these are all children that were considered to have comorbidities and if co-infected with the COVID-19, would have a higher chance of being hospitalized. The other group that I get asked a lot about is that my child is allergic to penicillin, my child is allergic to um, pollen, to dust. Can he take or can she take the vaccine? The fact is you can proceed with a vaccine for any of these, even if you have a family history of allergies. The ones that we would say can proceed to vaccine, but with a precaution, are those that have had any sort of immediate allergic reaction to other vaccines. And the ones that are contraindicated are those that have had a reaction to the first dose of the vaccine, then you are not going to get the second dose. We do not advise it at all. Side effects, that's one of the common things we'll get asked as well. Common side effects when you get the injection, major one for the groups that were studied that had the vaccine from 12 to 25 years of age was pain at the site of the vaccine. In terms of the next 48 to 72 hours, you'd be looking out for things like tiredness, headache, muscle pain, chills. And although you know that there may be side effects, we do not advise taking paracetamol, Tylenol, Pienol, Aramol, um, Ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin, any of those prior to taking the vaccine, because we're not sure how it will affect the immune response of the vaccine. As I said, if you had a severe or immediate allergic reaction after getting the first dose, you should not get a second dose. But I don't want it to be confused and a, a severe Im immediate allergic reaction to be confused with an anxiety or panic attack at the time of getting a vaccine. And this can happen, especially with the teenagers who need to get a vaccine. They're also been hearing a lot about it. And they can actually complain and tell you they're having breathing problems. I can't breathe. Or I feel like if my throat is closing, I'm choking. But even though they're telling you that, they're also able to speak with you, which means they are moving air. If you are having an allergic reaction to the vaccine, you would actually be having a florid rash, you will have swelling of the mouth, the tongue. You can also, if the swelling of the throat, you would actually hear them making this noise. <laughs> and that is significant to tell you. But if they're, they're telling you and they're breathing fast, they hyperventilate when they're having an anxiety attack, then, and they're speaking with you, they will also feel dizzy because they're breathing faster. They're blowing out their carbon dioxide, so they're going to feel faint. They can look, they sweat, look pale. And these are all things that are just because of the anxiety that they can sometimes feel with receiving a vaccine. So we have to be very careful when we're looking at the reactions as well. And what most of you all are very anxious about is the fact that the reports of the cases of myocarditis and pericarditis that are in the adolescents and the young adults. And the fact is it is rare. It's 12.6 cases per million doses of second dose. You can get it after the first dose, but it's more common, especially after the second dose. Again, boys, as usual, they always have something to, to, to rave about. They are more affected than the girls. And 100% of the cases that actually complained or had myocarditis complained of chest pain. They can also have that their heart is beating fast and they're having difficulty to breathe. When would you be looking out for these signs of myocarditis or pericarditis? Two to three days, and sometimes even up to 10 days after the second dose of the mRNA vaccine. And they usually resolve. Now, I wanna put this in the context of myocarditis post-vaccine versus myocarditis post-COVID-19 infection. And post your second dose of vaccine, the boys can have 
56 to 69 cases per 1 million. Females, 8 to 10 cases. But if your boy child actually contracts COVID infection, 450 cases per 1 million will get myocarditis. That is a six times higher risk of getting myocarditis from the COVID virus itself than from the vaccine. Booster shot, two dose. The FDA has given approval uh, from the 12th of August to certain groups of people to receive a booster shot. And these are certain immunocompromised people who may not have mounted a strong enough immune response to the vaccine. And the particular groups are the solid organ transplants or anybody who's equivalent to that level of immunocompromise. And this can be administered at least 20 days after completion of the initial mRNA COVID-19 series. Pfizer's gotten approval for if you're 12 years and over, Moderna if you're 18 years and over. And a lot of people are asking, well, is this also going to be normally for us? We have to wait and see based on how the immune response is and as the studies are going on. People ask, well, why are there different timing? Pfizer's 21 days, Moderna's 28 days, Sinopharm is 21 days, AstraZeneca is two months. Let's wait longer and maybe we'll get a better immune response. All of the timings of the doses are based on clinical trials. So they've checked it for certain periods and different vaccines will have a different approach. When we started with the vaccines, we had a very limited supply early on. So a lot of the countries decided, let's try and vaccinate as much of the population with at least one dose. One dose is better than none, and at least they will have some protection. So the delay of the second dose. When they were doing that, they saw the level of protection after the first dose was causing people to get, the, get variants to get and to be hospitalized. So the level of protection was better after two doses. So as more vaccines became available, they started to give the second dose as per the trials. Variants were also increasing. As the virus multiplies, the more the virus gets to make more and more babies, as Dr. Montai says, there's going to be sometimes a mistake when it's actually making those babies. And that one mistake and when they're actually causing new babies leads to a new variant. But if you're fully vaccinated, you can combat this and that will have less likelihood of having variants. And the reason for that is seen in this graph. A lot of you guys are doing your PCR testing and some of the PCRs will have something called a CT value. What that CT value means is the number of times when the machine has to revolve around your sample to pick up the viral particles and see if you have the virus. So if the machine cycles just two times and picks up the virus, that means you have a high viral load. If the machine has to circle and circle at least 30 to 40 times, it means your viral load is not that high. So this here, the green line is a vaccinated person. The red line is an unvaccinated person. If you would notice in the first five days, whether you are vaccinated or not, and you contract the coronavirus, both of you all vaccinated and unvaccinated will shed the same amount of viral particles. However, after five days, the unvaccinated person will have a decrease in their viral load and their viral shedding, making it less likely to have multiplication for those babies to cause variants. Whereas an unvaccinated person will keep shedding and have that virus being reproduced right through up until 28 days. This, I think, tells you that we really need to get our vaccinated population high so that we can have less variants and not see something worse off than what we're seeing with the Delta. So thank you very much for listening. And I hand you over now to, as Dr. Monsai says, our MC.
Thank you so much, Dr. Ramcharata Maharaj. Um, we have a record number of persons joining us this evening for uh, today's panel, and I wanted to just let them know. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. Please continue to do so. We are just going to let our panelists finish their presentations, and then we will progress to the question and answer segment. So now I'm going to invite Mrs. Vandana Sue Sankar Ali, who works at the Children's Authority as an assessment manager. We're going to invite her to do her presentation now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to the organizers of this uh, program for having the Children's Authority. The Children's Authority being the primary agency that is responsible for the care and protection of the nation's children and for defending and supporting child rights. And therefore, any matter that has to do with the safety, health, and well-being of our children, the authority is happy to be part of that discussion. So today, we will be covering uh, some discussions on the psychological impact of COVID-19 on our children. And so when we look at what have our children experienced over the course of the last 18 months or so, we see that one of the primary agents of their socialization and their education has been cut from them. Schools have closed. They've had to adjust to virtual classes. Many children's learning needs have gone unmet. And I will, I'm, I will leave a little bit more of this to our next speaker. Uh, who will be speaking more on the educational perspective, but what we do know is that many children learn in different ways and not all respond very well to the virtual classroom where they may not receive that one-on-one -on -one, uh, intervention. Because they are, children can't see their friends, they can't see their family, there's a degree of social isolation. And that in itself has been very traumatic for many children they've been lacking a lot of their social and recreational activities. So, you know, just as adults, we enjoy going to the mall, going out to dinner, you have your social events where you may meet your friends and all of these constitute a sort of coping as we go through any challenges in our lives. Children too need their extracurricular activities, their social activities, and in the absence of these routines, they also are lacking some of the core coping resources that they would need to navigate these challenging times. Children, like adults, are battling fears of contagion. They're fearful of contracting the virus for themselves, for their loved ones, and therefore they're dealing with a lot of those same fears and anxieties that we as adults are dealing with. Some children have unfortunately lost persons within their immediate family circle and their extended circle. And so they too have experienced grief and loss associated with this virus. By virtue of being exposed to the virtual classroom, and of course being at home some more, many of our children have experienced increased screen time and increased media consumption as well, and that comes with a host of other consequences, which we will talk about soon. Parents in the home are battling uh, managing their jobs, supervising children, working remotely and managing all the demands of everyday life. Persons who have been unemployed are trying to seek jobs and therefore adults everywhere all around the world are highly stressed, burnt out, fatigued. And I know many, many people can relate to this who are listening and therefore children are also bearing the brunt of that experience from their parents. When there are uh, socioeconomic challenges as they are right now with job losses and a lot of persons having a financial slowdown. Uh, there are consequences in the home that children have had to experience with their basic needs being unmet when uh, their basic needs such as food and shelter and clothing can't be afforded during these times. And of course, one of the biggest concerns of the Children's Authority would be our concern for safety and increased risk and vulnerability at any period of time, but particularly during a period of time when there is increased social isolation and a lack of access to coping resources. So what's been the impact of all of these experiences on our children? And I'm just gonna leave this dashboard of statistics up uh, that reflects some data from the Children's Authority and draw your attention particularly to the first graph on the top left. And you will see here that since our six years of operationalization, unfortunately, it's a very grim picture. The authority has received 
in general, between four to 5,000 cases of child abuse and child maltreatment every year. Those are some horrible figures. But if you look at 2020, you would see in 2021, we're maintaining some consistency. And so COVID has stopped a lot of things, but what it has not stopped is child abuse and child maltreatment. And that is, that is a very, very dire picture that we're facing here. So it means that children are socially isolated. They are not in uh, regular contact with teachers, with family, with friends, despite having social contact cut and despite them being within what we would assume to be their immediate protective circle much more often, we're seeing that the statistics of child abuse are remaining consistent. And if you look at 2021, that's just about seven months of data, you will see that we're keeping right up on track. So this is a cause for concern for us because the general things and resources that children would usually rely upon to be able to cope and to be able to, set, to report cases of child abuse, they're, they're different in this COVID environment. So what are some of the, the psychological and psychosocial uh, consequences of this virus in the lives of our children? Well, much like the adult population, we're seeing that children are struggling with mental health challenges we're starting to see the impact of depression and anxiety upon our young people. And with our young people, a lot of the anxiety tends to center around their own fears of illness for themselves and others, but also anxiety surrounding exam stress, whether their exams are going to be canceled, this perpetual cycle of stress surrounding the prolonging of exams. And we know that the SEA was prolonged for a period of time and that came with a significant amount of distress for youth population. Other emotional and behavioral challenges that our children are experiencing when they are stressed and fearful. So it's very common to see uh, children displaying regressive behaviors, particularly younger children who may display behaviors that we think that they, they have already navigated. So they may go back when they're worried and scared and traumatized to thumb sucking, bed wetting, very clingy behavior. With the older children, you might start to see aggression, irritability, um, conflict. Uh, you may also see children's eating and sleeping patterns being affected. Um, and they tend to report a lot of physiological symptoms, a lot of physical symptoms associated with distress. So Dr. Amcharita Manarad spoke about some of these symptoms that might be reported as symptoms coming out of getting the vaccine, but it might very well be symptoms that are manifesting from anxiety. We're seeing here as well that their COVID brought about a slowdown of a lot of services. And so many core public health and other private therapeutic services paused during the course of the pandemic. And this meant that a lot of children who were in need of core health care and psychological and other therapeutic services did not have access in a timely manner. So children who required counseling, speech, occupational therapy, and other, other medical services did not have access until these services were able to be resumed. And in many cases, for counseling, for example, that has resumed largely in a virtual world, and many children still do not have access to be able to, to um, access these services. We spoke about the basic needs going on met when children have uh, who come from homes where there are financial challenges. Increased screen time also means that children spend a lot more time online, which increases vulnerability to cyberbullying, exploitation, internet sexual grooming is very real in our context, and therefore this increases the risk of exposure to these types of things, particularly when parents are very busy with all of the demands in the home are not able to adequately supervise their children while they are online. There has been an obvious disruption in education because of the challenges faced with attending in-person school. And because of that, the school is a primary agent of socialization and the development of children's communication skills. And therefore, because they are not in this environment with other children, with other teachers, navigating new areas of study and new areas of interaction, we are starting to see that just like adults, where we, we are finding ourselves becoming a little bit more reclusive, uh, we are seeing that 
In some cases, this can lead to some deficits in social and communication skills. A very, very important population to consider are children with special needs. And so children with special needs, such as children who may be on the autism spectrum, children with uh, attention deficits, they thrive on structure and routine. And during this pandemic, structure and routine has gone out of the window for, for many. You know, so when, there, when there's a lack of that, there can be an aggravation of symptoms because that very sense of stability is lacking. Now, here's an interesting phenomenon that we have had to face at the authority. Many of our children who are in state care, who may have contracted the virus and who have had to be quarantined face further social and emotional challenges. These children who have been removed for their own protection from their own home are already grappling with attachment difficulties, with abandonment issues, anxiety, emotional challenges. But when they have to now be quarantined because of contracting the virus, they are now away from their homes, away from their, their alternative care environments, away from their caregivers, and therefore filled with even more experiences of uncertainty. And when parents have, and relatives have contracted the virus, this is another interesting thing that we've seen. And there's no other person, relative, family, friend, fit person, guardian, to be able to care for children, where do they go? And so sometimes the authority has been faced with requests to find placement for children whose parents have been temporarily quarantined. And where do you place a child in that situation? Uh, and then what, now that people are being quarantined at home, uh, there's also the concern about how do those children's needs continue to be met when their parents have to maintain some degree of separation from them within, the own, within their own home uh, while ensuring that they too do not contract the virus. So these are just some broad consequences that our children have faced by virtue of being in an environment with COVID exposure. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do as we get prepared for children returning to school? And so one of the important things is to continue to reinforce the safety protocols and all those social distancing protocols, the observation of the three W's, and continue to teach these things to your children and model these behaviors for your children. We've always said that children learn from what they see not and, and what you do and not from what you tell them. It's also important to reassure them of safety and give them a sense of control. Many children are very, very worried about this situation as we are and therefore empowering them with the ways that they can protect themselves and keep others safe as well, reassures them with a sense of safety and gives them that sense of, of control and empowerment. Because they are filled with so much anxiety about what's happening, be available to listen and talk with them about their concerns and communicate in a very open and calm way about their concerns and be careful about how you discuss the pandemic. Yes, open discussion is very important, but again, children feed off the energy that you have within, within your home and, what, and the things that you say to them, they're listening very keenly and also feeding off of that. So you have to be aware of that. Now, because there are gaps in the social and communication skills of children, because they have been socially cut off in many ways, we've been encouraging parents and caregivers to find creative ways within your own setting to help develop and nurture these creative and other social and interpersonal skills. And those things are simple. You don't have to be a pediatrician or a psychologist or a mental health practitioner to be able to engage children in a way that really nurtures their skill set. And these can be simple play sessions, reading books, engaging in games with them, scavenger hunts, just having conversations in your household to really continue the trend of social, inter, uh, social interactions and building communication skills. Engage them in physical activities. Exercise has always been touted as one of the core buffers to stress. And so exercise, sports, runs, um, walks, going on hikes. And a lot of people have been sort of talking about, you're seeing a lot of pictures on social media of persons thriving um, and in, in these outdoor settings, really looking forward to that opportunity to get some fresh air and some exercise in. Teach your children coping skills so that when they feel anxious, when they feel depressed about the state that we're currently in, they have a toolkit of resources that they can rely on to be able to cope. 
maintain routines, not because COVID has destabilized many of our, our usual ways of functioning, means that within your own home, that has to go out of the window as well. So you maintain your, your eating times, your play times, and make sure the children are going to bed on time. You maintain time to social media so that there is a sense of normalcy and stability that is still being perpetuated in their lives. And of course, manage screen time. You know, um, screens have been doing a lot of babysitting and, you know, no judgment because people really have been juggling a lot. But that really needs to be managed and it really needs to be um, supervised as far as possible so that we, we uh, escape and avoid some of the negative consequences. And of course, today's discussion is on vaccination. So, of course, parents and caregivers are also being encouraged to make informed decisions as it relates to your children and their vaccination status. I thank you very much. And I invite you all to the call of child protection, that we need to work together to defend and support children's rights and make child protection everybody's business. And COVID and vaccination and this entire discussion about preserving the health and well-being of our children is part of the child protection sphere. Thank you very much. Mrs. Vandana, Sue Sankar Ali, thank you so much for that presentation. And now I want to invite Dr. Hazel Ann Gibbs de Pisa, who's a teacher educator and assistant professor at the Center for Education at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. If you can make your presentation to our audiences now, we have a record 100, 1,011 persons viewing. So we are going to get to the question and answer once all of our presentations have been done. Dr. Gibbs de Pisa. Dr. DeBiza, I think you need to unmute your mic. Okay, so you're hearing me now? Yes, we are. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So again, thank you to the moderator. Thank you to the organizers of, of this program and for inviting me. And a special good evening to my colleagues on the panel and to all our viewers. As you realize, I am coming from a teacher's perspective. So here goes. COVID-19 is not a myth. It's a real threat to health and life. And we know that COVID has crossed all the borders, but its destructive path can be curtailed. So, wear, watch, wash. Wear your mask, watch your distance, wash your hands. It's wise to follow the protocols and guidelines of the experts. What is sad is that so many people did not choose to follow the protocols. And going forward, we need to remember to follow the protocols. On the question of the COVID vaccine, we know that COVID started as an epidemic, mushroomed into a pandemic, and has generated a lot of fear, a lot of doubt, death, panic in the society. So we have a crisis on our hands, and crises must be managed. Measures must be taken to reduce the panic and mitigate the crisis and restore some semblance of normalcy to society before it implodes. So I'm a teacher. I'm not qualified to verify, justify, or deny the choices and the propositions for management. And I'm not trained in virology and immunology and the psychology behind the virus. But you have been hearing the experts. The experts in the fields continue to provide, and even just this evening alone, an abundance of clinical, statistical, and other information. But always, there are more questions than answers. That is the norm. So we have some hot questions, which of course I cannot answer. Is it safe for my immunocompromised or high allergic, asthmatic, enlarged heart child to take the vaccine? But you got the answers from the doctors already. 
if one in a thousand develop complications or die, what likelihood of my child being the one in this thousand? We know that those are concerns that parents have. What are the side effects? And how long will the vaccine keep my child protected? And we've got some answers from our doctors on the panel. But those are not the only important questions in this situation. So please permit me to focus on concerns about the impact on education and the educational well-being of our children and teachers. So my major concern, of course, is educational well-being. There is a crisis in education. We can't deny that. And COVID-19 is pivotal to the situation that we are in. But the COVID vaccine is one step, an important step, I agree, an important step, but only one step on the stairway to mitigate our children's well-being. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, an international organization that works to build better policies and better lives, there are eight key areas of focus on the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on education. And coming straight out of their publication, one is public financing of education. Two, international student mobility. And we know all the stories that went around what happened when COVID struck. Of course, there are other areas affecting students who have to travel to study. Three, the loss of instructional time delivered in a school setting. And we know about that and we've heard more about it. Four, measures to continue students' learning during school closure. And we see what we have been able to do with that. Five, teachers' preparedness to support digital learning. And we do have some questions around that. Six, when and how to reopen schools. That needs some questioning. Seven, class size, a critical parameter for the reopening of schools. And we need to raise some questions there. And eight, vocational education during the COVID. And vocational education, because we realize the need, of course, for a different approach as well. So what is the impact on our children's education? We remember that education is the process of facilitating learning or acquisition of knowledge, skills, values, morals, and beliefs, facilitating learning. And of course, COVID has interfered and interrupted that facilitation of learning. The other aspect of that is what has happened to the values and the morals and the beliefs that our children are being given during this pandemic? We look at the reaction of parents, of teachers, and we need to recognize that as uh, Mrs. Susanka Ali, I think it is just said, we need to recognize that these children are also suffering from all the depression and stress, et cetera. And they are also learning how the present adults are dealing with the situation. Are we thinking in terms of doing some kind of intervention for them as they grow out of this trauma that they are experiencing? Education, our education system, we know has been given to us from the, the colonial age. And sadly, we perpetuate the colonial approach to education where the curriculum is the most important thing. But we need to teach the child, not just the curriculum. And so having had to go through all of the, the trauma of COVID-19, and now as we go through another trauma of trying to get out of it, we need to be fully aware that the teacher's perspective, teacher's attitudes, teacher's discomfort, all of these things impact on our children. And therefore, 
we have to raise some questions around that area as well. When we talk about children's well-being, well-being is a state of being comfortable, healthy, and happy. And we see what makes children comfortable and happy. Being able to stick on to their friends, to hug and, and share and, and laugh. And, and obviously, the COVID-19 has taken that away from them. So they are suffering the consequences out of that. And again, as we got from the, the Children's Authority presentation, we must recognize that the children are suffering these things. And therefore, the question is, are we paying attention to developing interventions for our children? Or are we expecting that things will just go on business as usual once um, the situation gets clear? We need to be very mindful of that. So how do we mitigate the impact? We need to pay attention. And again, I'm so thankful that um, the, the other presentation spoke about these things, the needs of the children, their physiological needs. In the school, when they come to school, do they have breakfast? Their safety needs, are they going to feel safe and secure when they come? Belonging, right? The kinds of relationships that they are allowed to make and how are we going to deal with these things? Are we going to be just screaming at the children? You know, you're not supposed to touch each other. You know, you're not supposed to share anything to eat. You know, you're not supposed to. Is that going to be the approach or are we going to be planning how we will treat with these situations as they arise? And we know that they will arise. The whole question of esteem, right? We need to have even more positive classroom culture because these children are coming, have been under attack and therefore they need much more support. And of course, they, they, at the high point, self-actualization. Are we going to facilitate learning for our children? And are there planned interventions for that? You see, coming out of the same OECD um, document, there are some things that we need to pay attention to. The supportive environments. Are we preparing for the supportive environments? We know that the crisis has exposed inadequacies and inequities, but are we preparing supportive environments. Are we asking questions about that? Are we preparing to reinvent learning environments that will complement student-teacher relationships? Or are we going to continue as we have been? Things have changed, you just have to do what you have to do without any consideration for planned intervention. We know that we have made very serious efforts to keep our children learning, right? But then many of them had to rely more on their own resources to continue learning. And that has an impact on them as well. And of course, our teachers, many of them had no training for the new switch and they just had to go with the flow. Is there a supportive environment for our teachers to help them to cope? Because remember, whatever they project are going on to our children. What about those children who are at risk? Have we done the research? And is anybody asking if we have done the research necessary to really cope with those children who are at risk? And well, of course, the whole question of finance, funding, as we saw. And we know that changes are going to be made in terms of that. But what we need to remember is that while we are concerned about spending money on education now, because education depends on tax money, we need to bear in mind that these same children 
are going to be the key to tomorrow's tax income. Because if they don't get a proper education at this point, what will we have for the future? And of course, the, the, the famous quotation, the future of our nation lies in our children's school bags. I don't have to say who and when and where for that. So one of the major issues, when and how to reopen schools. And the OECD provided us with some steps. Step one, conduct a risk assessment for staff. Are we doing that? And is anybody concerned about whether this is done or not? Step two, develop clear protocols on social distancing. Is that being done? Or are we going to just assume that when they come to school, they will stay apart? We know that there are some schools that will be able to shift their, their furniture and have space, but that is in the minority. The majority of schools do not have the space. Are we planning to make an intervention in that regard? Or are we just hoping that things will work out when the time comes. Step three, revise attendance policies to accommodate health-related absences. Policies, we need to work on policies. Ensure adequate training of teachers and staff. And we know that that is always an issue. But the point is, are we asking those questions along with the question of simply getting the vaccine. We need the vaccine. It will help the situation, but it is like building a house and we have the bricks and we have the sand and we have the steel. And when we're ready to build, we have no cement. We still can't build the house. Something is missing and we need to balance the situation. Class size, a critical parameter for the reopening of schools. And we need to spend some time, provide some kind of research and planning in terms of getting these things in place. Because if we don't, we find ourselves, yes, being vaccinated, going out to school and saying, yes, we can go back. But then what happens when we get there? So let me end where I began. COVID-19 is not a myth, it is real. And we know that there are lots of the, the, the stories that are going around, but we need to recognize it is not a myth, it is real, okay? It started as an epidemic, it has grown into a pandemic, and we are hearing now that it is on the highway to becoming endemic, something that we will just have to live with as we live with all the other things, the smallpox and the measles and the everything else. So. Are we preparing for that? And one way is to follow the protocols and the guidelines. We have to encourage that. In addition, so in addition to the protocols and the guidelines, there are other essential steps and key areas that must be adequately researched and addressed if we want to reduce the impact of COVID on education and ensure the educational well-being of our children. And not just of our children who are the future, but also of our adults who are the present. Management of any crisis resides in the managers of the structure, but management thrives on buy-in from the managed. So let us make sure that our education is a process for facilitating learning. And we are required as far as possible to live peaceably, to be our brother's keepers, especially now, to pray for our leaders, they need it, and to let love be our golden rule. Love for God, love for ourselves, and love for our neighbors. I thank you, blessings to all. Dr. Gibbs de Pizza, thank you so much for that presentation. And of course, our final pa panelist is Dr. Nicole Ramachan, who is an immunogeneticist and assistant professor at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Ramachan. Thank you so much, Sweeney, and thank you so much for all our panelists for the fantastic 
um, presentation so far. This has um, been um, one of the more exciting topics for me in particular, um, because during starting this process since uh, you know earlier this year and trying to share all this information on vaccination, um, we didn't really get a chance to specifically focus on our children and youth. And I think it's really very pivotal now with the arrival of the Pfizer and Trans-Tobago that we try to get those answers to um, our population. Um, I start with, of course, I'm a geneticist, so I have to start with genetics, right? So those of you who are listening will, will probably remember uh, gene comes from, um, you know, it's created, is, is, is basically DNA or RNA, right? Depending on what organism you are. If you're a human, it's all DNA. If you're a mammal, generally it's all DNA. Um, if you're a virus, it could be DNA or RNA, right? So SARS-CoV um, came from most likely a bat species and it had some uh, interim hosts there, like a camel or a uh, pangolin and those kinds of things. But basically we believe that it was because of the wildlife trafficking and habitat destruction and climate change. And those of you children who are listening would remember how we always talk about climate change being important. Well, this is one of the important things. Um, it's a very typical for coronaviruses to mutate and be able to change hosts. And it's one of what we call a zoonotic disease that was able to actually jump hosts from a, an animal to human. Has this happened before? Many, many, many times um, in history, including the original SARS, the Ebola virus that we had in Africa um, creating a pandemic and, and havoc um, in 2018, um, bird flu and many more. Now, swine flu, Asian flu, you know, all the basically the influenza, so all genetic that started from an animal. What happens when it jumped into the host, though, it was exposed to an adult host. So it was able to actually change the spike protein of the original bat virus to be able to now hook into a, a ACE2 receptor of the adult um, um, alveolar cells. Now, what at that point in time, what we know is that it wasn't really readily able to um, hook into the ACE2 receptors of children and youth because they are structurally different. Since that, because of the variants and the mutations that these viruses go through, it's been able to mutate now. So now it's actually better, um, more capable at actually infecting um, children and youth. And of course, now it's mutated into different forms that makes it more transmissible generally, more able to evade immunity and really cause issues because we've had so many people in, our, in the world that have worked on immune, um, really, you know, had no immunity, were, were um, not immunized for so long. And that's really what's created a lot of the issues that we're seeing now. Um, we can test using the antibody test, the RT-PCR test or the antigen test, and the um, RT-PCR test, and that's how we know if we're infected with this, right? That can actually be used in the incubation period up to two weeks of um, post-infection. And the antigen test is usually at day zero, to two weeks, and then the antibody test is long after. That does not tell if you have any virus right now. And I, 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 I say this because a lot of people ask for the wrong test. And you have to be aware of what test you need to do at whatever time that you need to do it, right? So that is this right here is a little time that I can't tell you based on your onset of symptoms, what test you should do. So antibody test is to know if it is you've ever had um, COVID-19 before, tells you if you're asymptomatic, if you had an infection, but the RT-PCR test and the antigen test kind of tells you right now what you have, right? Um, What's been happening around the world too is that the increased numbers of cases have been resulting in increased numbers of deaths. And I put this here, and this of course is not by age, right? This is just, you know, um, any age. I put this here to make you realize, because um, a lot of people don't, if you look at the ruling seven day average um, and you compare what was happening in May 28, we had one of the highest rates of death in the world. Um, as specifically in our region at that time. Um, it's come down quite a bit, but um, not as, as low as we wanted to. And hence all of the restrictions and lockdowns and this extended period of time um, that we have actually had to isolate. Right now, uh, at, in May 28, we're at 11.23, and it actually was higher um, than India, which at the time was actually peaking um, with millions of deaths per day. And I remember the reason why it's low, it's because we're looking at deaths per million. And I remember India has billions of people, right? Well, 1 billion people, I should say, but millions more than Trinidad. So that's how come we're looking at that relative rate. Right now, we had about 5.31, which is lower than we were. But as you can imagine, um, by compar comparing the other countries, we are still the highest um, in the region that we are looking at here in terms of Mexico, Brazil, Guyana, Jamaica, United States, United Kingdom, France, India, and Canada. So our cases are not coming down definitely as fast as we want, and our deaths, most importantly, are not coming down as fast as we want. And including, um, you know, we're actually having now, uh, or we've had recorded cases of, of pediatric um, uh, 
deaths. Um, in terms of the United States, while of course, I mean, it's much lower than you know, adults, right? So in terms of the United States, they're also seeing increasing um, increase in deaths and cases and our other panelists spoke to this. Um, and they're noticing that um, after initially decreasing in early 2021, the adolescent hospitalization increased a lot um, after March to April. Now, if you compare that to flu, because a lot of people hit us with, well, you know, it's just like the flu. No, it's not, right? So if you look at this here, we're looking at 12 to 17 year olds. This thick line here is COVID-19 um, through the surveillance weeks. And they're talking about 2020, 2021, 2017, 18, um, 18, 19, and 1920 for influenza. And it's much, much higher. So in terms of number of cases for the adolescents, it's much higher. Um, and in terms of hospitalization, it's almost three times as high, right? Um, also ICU beds in certain regions because of the low vaccination rates. And of course, because of the lifting of restrictions that occurred too soon, we're seeing a lot of breakouts um, and um, a lot of increased cases in ICU beds being unavailable. Um, hospital admissions in the under 50s have now increased um, that more than 95% of the people hospitalized are now unvaccinated. So it's becoming a pandemic of the unvaccinated and it's actually becoming much more prevalent in the younger um, individuals in the population, right? Um, and it's continued to be overwhelming in populations around the world, um, including these examples in Houston and Florida, where they've actually run out of beds and they've had to, you know, um, airlift people. Um, uh, one of the panelists mentioned the long COVID, and this is a real issue as well, too. It's not just the acute COVID and recovering from that particular stage, which, of course, is serious in some cases. I mean, most cases with children are mild, and we're lucky enough to still have that um, be the truth. Um, but however, we're seeing that increase in number of cases and of course the decrease in number of long COVID as well too. And this is actually um, also demonstrated in the UK data where 4.4% um, of children had symptoms more than four weeks post COVID and about 2% of them had um, almost eight weeks after. So it's a, it's a serious concern. But how are these children getting infected, right? I mean, they're at home in our case, they're not at school. Really what's happening is that a lot of the clinicians are reporting that whole households are actually being infected and that's what's happening the parent um, is bringing the virus home in places like the united states where schools are not closed the teacher is bringing it to the classroom and that is of concern um, we have to actually be really really aware of this um, moving forward um, in terms of what is happening to we are seeing variants i mentioned that to you before about the mutations and as the mutations change these variants become apparent these um are uh, usually in the spike protein. The spike protein kind of sticks out in the surface of the cell, as I mentioned, and that's the thing that changes and hooks onto different you know, um, our receptors and different types of animals, different types of hosts. And the virus wants to live, and what the virus wants to replicate. That's what the virus's entire um, evolutionary push is to do. And as the var variants change, the viruses change as well, obviously. And as the, the unimmunized population stays large, so in countries like India, we see a lot of variants coming up. Countries like Brazil, we saw a lot of variants coming up. Countries like United States, UK, where they had a lot, and of course, Italy and a lot of the countries where you had a large amount of um, uh, variants being able to develop because of that high number of immunized, unimmunized um, people. And what we are concerned about is whether or not these mutations, uh, for example, these listed here, um, in these particular variants here, um, can actually allow them to mutate. And if they mutate far enough away from the original, then we call them a variant of interest, a variant of concern, or a variant of high consequence. Very luckily, we don't have any variants of high consequences yet um, that we, we've officially um, registered because they are the ones that completely evade the immune system and we can never sometimes even probably even detect them properly. The ones we're concerned about are the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, uh, or the ones that we've had, I should say. Increase in transmissibility caused some sort of detrimental change um, and increase in virulence. What that means, it makes people sicker faster, um, in some cases, eight times as faster. It makes children now more sicker than it did before, and it infects people that it never used to before. But what is most important is we don't want to see evading vaccines and our weapons, our therapeutics, and our diagnostics, and those kinds of things. And unfortunately, we're seeing that a little bit with the Delta. We saw it with the Beta and the Gamma um, as well, um, and the Alpha to a lesser extent. But what we're seeing with the Delta worldwide, so this is from November when it first appeared in um, uh, India, and um, it also appeared in Mexico around the same time. Um, and um, it started, a couple of cases were seen in um, Singapore. 
but look what happened at post February 2020 um 24 it just skyrocketed in India and once it became prevalent in India it took over and this is repeated in every single other country right um including Canada now so it's almost 99 to 100 percent of the cases in Singapore United Kingdom um and India and um uh United States it's getting there and Mexico but of course if they're seeing it's dropping off in the United States as well because of their high vaccination rate um you know not dropping off fast enough but it's increasing in Brazil and Canada so the Delta is is scary because of that the ability for it to be able to spread and also what's scary is because the symptoms vary especially in children um it can be just a runny nose so people are sending them to school um sending them around the place normal um you know a lot of the the places like the US and so on have have decreased their mandates for masking, which is becoming a problem because some people are walking around Delta and don't even know it. And um, that's one of the issues that we're seeing. And Florida in particular seeing a big siege of COVID in particular. Uh, this is a this was a, a, a case study that I put up and how if they were affecting the Florida um, ICUs in terms of the, the even though their lowest risk of severe outcomes in the population, um, they are seeing a, a big increase in that population. Um, but is the Delta really um, as bad as we think? Well, it can spread, right? So the Delta variant is very highly contagious and unvaccinated people have no defenses. If you are vaccinated, the possible spread during the short time it takes for the existing immunity eliminated virus is much smaller. And if you wear your mask, it's even 100% more effective. And what has been great is a lot of the data, um, I'm not presenting it here today because it gets a little complicated, but there are a lot of studies that came out of Singapore um, the UK um, and different countries around the world that actually showed that the Brazil in terms of the P1 variant, the gamma variant, that the vaccines are very effective against these variants, including the Delta. So if you're vaccinated and you get infected with the Delta variant, the virus can very quickly be cleared by immune system and you can be protected against severe illness and disease and death. Um, however, if you're unvaccinated, your immunity is not there. You have none. So you have to spend time and energy trying to recover from the virus, develop immunity and fight it off. And that period of time causes that infection to kind of grow in that individual and can lead to severe disease and death. The reason why vaccines do not prevent infection is because a vaccine is not a block on your entire body. A mask is. So a mask can physically stop the entry of the virus into your body, but a vaccine does not. So the virus can still come into your nose and come into your mouth physically, but the amount of viral load, as one of the panelists said, is much less if you're vaccinated because it's not allowed to replicate because your antibodies recognize it right away and say, I fight in this and get rid of this guy. Whereas if you're unvaccinated, you have no antibodies. So it can get in, it can hook into your alveolar um, cell receptors, spread, wreck havoc, create long COVID, who knows what in children and adults. And that's really what the problem is. And that is really what we want to prevent with vaccination. Um, let's talk about the vaccines. In terms of the mRNA vaccines, that's like your Pfizer, which we have available for children now, and your Moderna, which are available in some countries um, uh, and will be available later on um, as, as approval becomes um, a, a, you know, apparent for them in different countries, right? Um, the mRNA sequence of the spike protein is packaged into a fat molecule that's stuck into a vaccine, stuck into the arm. The virus now um, is not present at all right? There's no infection. The mRNA is uh, encoded into the part of the cell that makes proteins. It spits it back out and your antibodies are produced against it. Your T cells, your B cells, everybody comes to fight and you get an immune response. So next time that spike protein is seen by the body, you get a good response. What's great about this is this fat molecule dissolves right away. Um, it goes away. So all that's left is the mRNA that is, get, is now produced um, by your ribosomal cell, um, parts of your cell machinery to be able to produce those antibodies in response. So the bad thing about this, it has to be kept at really cool temperatures, but we've been able to you know, do that and be able to package it properly and be able to deliver it into arms in Trinidad, which is fantastic. The adenoviral vector um, for children. The adenoviral vector vaccines are like your AstraZeneca and your Johnson Johnson. Same concept of the mRNA, which is the spike protein, the same thing I was telling you about that mutates, that is what is really good about the fact that these things are still covering these variants, is there is enough of it that makes it similar enough to the variants that it can recognize. The antibodies that are produced can be recognized by all these spike proteins that are present in all the variants. They're not as great 
of course, as the original, but there's still some degree of protection, which is what we, we are very glad for. Um, and you also have your viral vector packaging, which gives a little extra boost to the immune system to get a little more angry, to fight a little better, to be able to produce more antibodies. So that's the story of this one. And it's great because it can be stored at two to eight degrees um, Celsius, but those are not approved for children. The Sinopharm is the whole inactivated vaccine, old school from smallpox days, throw some chemical on it, kill it. It's not active, active. it cannot infect you. Throw it into a vaccine, stick it in your arm, and you have an immune response against the whole vaccine, not just the spike protein. Um, very effective, again, been used in different um, different uh, populations for children and for different parts, um, uh, and in different parts of the world, very effectively. I wanted to talk about the DNA vaccines. None of them have been WHO approved yet, but what's exciting about them is that they have the same concept of the DNA packaged in lipid nanoparticles, but they're packaged in a way that they can be delivered with a nasal spray. So all children, yay, no needles. So that could be our future. Um, it's not there yet. It's still in phase uh, three approval stages, but it's the same concept. It goes into the cell, the DNA makes the uh, viral proteins, comes out, antibodies get produced, long-term antibody response, right? Which is what we want. And this is really the most important thing here. It's almost as 100%, all of these um, that are WHO approved are almost 100% effective against preventing hospitalization and death if you are post fully vaccinated, right? That's what we want. I always put this up because I want people to understand this is not something that happened yesterday. This is not something, you know, a vaccine is not developed in two days. We don't test two people. It's not experimental. This has approval from the WHO, which is our highest level of approval. And how they did that is that these companies, in this case, this is Sinopharm and this is Oxford AstraZeneca, took these vaccine products, tested it in phase one, phase two, and phase three trials in all these different countries with all these different strange looking numbers. Each of these numbers refers to a single trial that has over 50,000 people sometimes, 10,000 people, 5,000 people, depending on where it was run. All of that data gets fed into the SAGE, which is the very smart people, much, much smarter than me, that sits on the WHO advisory board and says, you know, all, we're going to go through all of the states and decide what is safe and what is not. And they were able to actually go through all of that, spend their time, approve it, send it back and say, yes, these countries, go ahead and use it. And we've been able to actually say, okay, well, we're gonna use that in many different countries. And then now every country that uses it sends back data. And now that is like an ongoing event that takes place um, from the first time the vaccines went out back in October um, 2020 in arms um, and in the first um, first test all the way to now. So it's like really the, the, the largest um, data set that we've ever had for any vaccine ever. And I want you to notice this here too. This is the vaccine track tracker that tells you, okay, we have about 15 approved vaccines, but over 339 in trials, 119. And this is the line here that says five vaccines no longer progressing, right? So we throw them out if they don't work. Nobody wants to be the person that says, okay, well, I'm going to develop a vaccine that doesn't work. No scientist thinks like that. It doesn't happen, right? So it gets thrown out right away. And we've been able to actually get to the point of, of proving Pfizer-BioNTech, um, in particular for children up to 12. Um, we're hoping to get the other stages of approval, um, uh, like uh, Dr. Video from Charter Mirage was saying, at different points. Hopefully, we're going to get all children um, uh, approved vaccines by 2022, early 2022. Um, and the recommendation, of course, is first dose, three weeks, second dose, and then after your second week, after a second dose, you, you consider to be fully vaccinated. Your children are considered to be fully vaccinated. Um, and we're hoping to get authorization for the others as they come. We have 4.79 billion vaccines in arms as of today. That is fantastic. And they're being used um, in different countries and different now in, in many different countries in different ways. Oxford AstraZeneca is in about 183, Pfizer is in about 114. Those are the most two popular. Sana Farm is in about 65. So it's very, very popular in terms of the amount of vaccines that are in arms and the amount of data that we've been able to get to say, okay, well, it's safe for children, it's not safe for children, it's safe for adults, it's safe for this group. And we've been able to use that data to be able to effectively give advice. Um, Trans-Tobago has been better lately because of the availability of vaccine. We're still not where we want to be. We are 33% with at least one, sh one shot in arm, 24% um, fully vaccinated. Um, we're still behind Guyana and Barbados. We've done quite well. Um, and of course, way behind Singapore and Canada that are in the 70s and um, United K Kingdom, even Bermuda 
um, on the Maldives who are, I put up here because they're small island um, kind of states, they've done quite well. Um, and of course, the United States is at about 51% um, fully vaccinated. Um, what's been happening by age, they've also been very good <clears throat> at vaccinating the over um, 25 year olds, right? So look at the numbers that are in terms of at least one dose. And also now they've increased with the over 12 year olds, right? Um, but this number has to increase in order to be able to get them um, to the, where they want to be. And, and that's what we need to realize too, is that our population has to be counted. Our children have to be counted in that fully vaccinated population. In terms of safety, the myocarditis as we mentioned um, in the um, adolescents, but it's considered to be an acceptable risk because the condition is very mild, usually in people who have it. And it's literally like numbers like 275 cases among 5 million vaccinated people. So the numbers are very, very low. Um, so those are two things that says, um, and again, the vaccines under 12, they're actually trying to seek, um, decide whether or not they're going to full, go to full FDA. If they do, it's gonna take a little longer but we're gonna get it at some point in time between the end of this year and early next year. Long COVID also can be assisted um, with vaccination. Um, universal masking can help as well too. Um, when should kids wear a mask? Basically to an over and you can train them. Um, if they're exposed to somebody in your family who is medically not able to be vaccinated, who's immunocompromised, encourage them to wear masks around them. Um, why should you wear a mask if you're vaccinated? Because the virus can uh, have little time to replicate inside the cells if you're vaccinated. If you're unvaccinated, the virus has more time to replicate and actually be able to, to be able to uh, mutate. However, the vaccinated people can, as I mentioned before, still house viral particles and you can still get spits on people, you can still blow your nose and get you know those particles in the air and infect others. So even if you're vaccinated, I encourage you, please, please, please wear your masks, right? Um, if we go back to school in, la in, in real life, we should have mask mandates and those kinds of things still, because that is where the infection is occurring, where we're seeing now with countries where they've reduced that. Um, vaccinated people are also much safer than unvaccinated people and they're much less likely to get infected. And if they do get infected, we're not saying that they don't, um, it's usually been, been about four days before you fight it off, before you clear it. Um, best case scenario for unvaccinated person is seven to 14 days, even if they are symptomatic. Um, and of course, if you're vaccinated, you're much less contagious and you're less likely, of course, to get severe disease and death, right? What about the fetus um, as a child or breastfeeding infants? Well, they've been recommending um, the uh, in the United States and around the world that pregnant women and breastfeeding women um, be vaccinated here in Trinidad. I think we are recommending for breastfeeding women to be vaccinated. Um, they haven't um, fully approved for pregnant women, yes, but um, they are a big part of the population that needs to be protected because they seem to have more severe cases of COVID-19 when they do get infected and that is um, and, and to be hospitalized and intubated and that is concerning. So we, we encourage um, uh, that that thought process to go into how we decide to assign vaccines in the near future and to be able to allow this population to be protected. I want to address this because I've probably gotten about 16 videos with this about antibody mediated viral enhancement. It doesn't occur with COVID-19, right? Um, if there's a rare breakthrough case in COVID-19, illness is much milder um, than, than those who are unvaccinated, full stop. Um, religious regions, the Pope has come out and urged everyone to get COVID-19 vaccines. He says that it shows love and we should all be vaccinated as fast as we can. Um, the boosters we mentioned, um, we're probably going to get to a point where we're going to get a third booster, um, especially for the immunocompromised, at least. Um, and for other people, if it is that it shows up that, that their immunity is waning. So we don't know long term how long the immunity is going to wait. How are we going to make sure people get vaccinated? Is it through mandates? Is it through fines? They started fining people in Canada um, if your child infects another person um, uh, with COVID-19 and you have not kept them home knowing that they've been infected. You're going to be fine. There's a lot of um, vaccine policy um, studies going on in different countries. Um, Canada's paused reopening now, and I've said, okay, well, we're going to insist that all our health workers and education workers be vaccinated. Um, in terms of in, in Ontario specifically, 81% um, of residents age 12 and older have already been vaccinated with at least one vaccine, so they've done very well. 73% have had both shots, but they're still saying um, we are not going to let you come to school or work in the school or work in this health system unless you take a rapid COVID-19 test um, every week if you're not vaccinated for the safety of the people. Uh, is there precedent? Yes, we're going to talk about this next week in our vaccine mandate 
um, a panel discussion, which I urge you all to attend. It's going to be pretty um, exciting. Um, and we have precedent for it. We have all have childhood vac um, vaccine mandates. Um, we all have immunization card in order to be able to graduate from university, from, from kindergarten all the way up to university, you have to be vaccinated against um, certain um, childhood diseases. And um, that is part of life. Um, how do we transition? We talked about all the different ways that this pandemic has affected our children um, and, and their different, different um, views and how we transition them back to school and how do we secure them and how do we keep them safe? And there are all kinds of different things that you can do. But the main thing at the end of the day is vaccination of the whole family. That is the way that you protect the children. Um, where can you get vaccinated? It's all um, in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, these are the sites. Um, of course, they started walk-ins from today and I urge you all to get out there and understand that we end this. Um, each of these data points and these numbers, unless you know somebody who's affected or know somebody who's sick or know somebody who's in the ICU who dies, you think, oh, okay, well, you know, it's only 2%. And I keep on telling every time I appear, I keep on saying, okay, think of 100 children or 100 adults and give me 2% of them, right? And that's what you're saying, that it's okay for 2% to, to be affected. And it's not, right? Um, we have to understand that getting vaccinated, is the more people around that are vaccinated, the safer our children are, the more that we wear our mask and we teach our kids to an older to wear a mask, we're going to be at the point where we protect those around us. We want to be down here where everybody that we know um, who can be vaccinated is vaccinated to be able to get that level of herd immunity to protect those who cannot be vaccinated. The people who are immunocompromised, well, right now, all children um, under the age of 12 are not are vaccinated. Um, we need to be able to protect them and we have to get to that point. Um, and, you know, the safety of your children, the safety of the elderly immunocompromised, we need to get back to work, we need to get our children in schools, basically the health and wellness of the humanity and how we want to end this pandemic. Vaccinations work. That's decreased if vaccinations increase. There's no doubt about it. And if we cut off the susceptible host population here and we are able to end this pandemic, that's how we do it. We cut this out. The cycle goes away, right? Um, we can limit the hosts. We can wear masks. We can isolate. We can sanitize. But if we do not vaccinate and cut out the circle here in this life cycle of this virus and achieve herd immunity, the chain of infection does not end. So my final take home is that get vaccinated, get vaccinated, get vaccinated. Thank you so much. Dr. Amlachan, I think that's a perfect way to end the presentation and to begin our question and answer segment. So my first question, we've got a lot of questions. And the first is from Akadija Joseph. She's saying, good evening. I am pro-vaccine, but when I was doing my research on the vaccine for teens, I see that the CDC in the United States said that it's giving some children heart disease. You are the experts. What is your advice to us parents pertaining to this Pfizer? What are the pros and cons? What do we have to expect after the vaccine? And what are we looking out for in our teens as they're still developing? Uh, I don't know who would like to take that question. Perhaps Dr. Ramcharita Maharaj. Hi. Um, the first part of her question, I think I addressed it in terms of the risk um, for the um, heart disease, the myocarditis, and that getting myocarditis from the COVID infection itself is six times higher than getting the myocarditis um, from the vaccine itself. And even the cases that actually got the myocarditis from the vaccine um, resolved. So the risk out the, the risk that they say in the vaccination outweighs the risk. Um, and therefore they will advise to, to still vaccinate. Um, second part of the question was about side effects, is it? What was the second part? Yeah, other side effects. Yeah. So the other side effects were things that I also discussed about um, at the vaccine site itself, the pain, the generalized aches, pains, um, body aches. Those are more what we would actually be looking at. And the fact is, history has shown that if there's going to be a, a very serious side effect to any vaccine, that it will show up within two months of us actually vaccinating. And that's why we were able to pick up on the, the risk of the clots, the risk of the heart in terms of the myocarditis and to look at it and to analyze it. So it is safe. Um, and even if the children do get a myocarditis, because I will tell you, 
my son has had myocarditis twice. He's 10 years of age and he's had myocarditis twice from an infection that we don't know what it was. And this was a year and something apart. So this is an illness that he would not have been ever vaccinated against and he got myocarditis. And twice, thankfully, he has been able to recover. And when the time comes and he reaches of his age, I will vaccinate him because what I had to go through with him actually having the illness and seeing what he had to do and he couldn't walk, those were things that would make me want to protect him from seeing him go back that because he asked me, Mama, am I going to get it a third time since I've gotten it two times already a year apart? Dr. Ramcharata Maharaj, thank you so much for sharing. Um, my second question is from Sheldon Stephen. He is asking, why is the Pfizer vaccine the only approved vaccine for use by children? I think Dr. Montai had said she was willing to take this question. Dr. Montai? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the question. The reason why Pfizer has been the one that's been used to a large extent is because in some ways we in the West have the most information about it. Um, there were clinical phase three clinical trials that were done where there were uh, 2,200 kids, 1,100 were vaccinated, um, 1,100 had the placebo. This is between 12 and 16 years old. And then they followed, these, they followed them up. These results have been published since that time. They, um, they got emergency use uh, authorization from the FDA for the use in this uh, lower age group, 12 to 16. And they um, have since then vaccinated probably about 10 million kids in America, most of them having Pfizer. So we have the benefit of that experience. Since then, Moderna has also done trials, um, which Dr. Ram Charita Maharaj mentioned, and they too have got authorization for use in a younger age group. We are aware that Sinopharm, which we're using now, has reportedly been used from kids as young as three years old, but we haven't really got the kind of information about its wider use in terms of, of in, in those age groups and, and the follow-up on them that we have had so far with Pfizer. So that Pfizer has really been out front because they did some of the earlier phase three trials in that group and also because they got authorization EUA after that. And we have the benefit of that many um, persons having, uh, many children having had the, the, the vaccine. So we have that as, as well. So I don't know if that answers it. I think it does. Um, it definitely does. Sorry, not that I think it does. It definitely does. Um, I wanted, Dr. Ramlachan just went through this, but I know this is something that we keep hearing all the time. So Nikita Price is asking, good afternoon, if the vaccine is not preventing my son and daughter from getting COVID-19, why vaccinate? I feel it's worth repeating. Okay, in the interest of time, um, viruses enter into your body anyway whether or not you're vaccinated or not so that is what we say when we say when we when we say that you it does not prevent infection um if you're vaccinated against the flu it does not in, uh, prevent infection if it is you vaccinated against any of these other childhood immunizations it may not prevent infection in that you will still get virus or bacteria in your body in that way however if you're vaccinated, your antibodies are there and your T cells and your B cells and so on have been able to produce uh, antibody response and they will be able to recognize the antigens from that virus and antigen being a protein. So when a virus enters into your body, it breaks down and it starts to release all its proteins, kind of like what the vaccine does by force, but it does so naturally. And when your body sees those proteins, it would recall out all its memory cells and all those kinds of fun fighting guys that we have in our body that mounts our immune system and says, okay, we've seen this guy before, let's kill it. When it is you're not vaccinated, you don't have that. So you're going to get sick and you're going to get severe disease and you're going to die. If what much more, I mean, I shouldn't say it like that, but you're much more likely to have that level of infection where you're going to go through that whole process of disease and um, uh, that could possibly end in, in death and um, long-term COVID and all these bad guy um, kind of effects. So that is the difference. So when it is we say it doesn't, it doesn't stop infection, it's because it's not a physical block. 
of the virus are coming into your body. That is what we're saying. But it does prevent replication of any large amounts usually, unless you have a breakthrough case. Now there are breakthrough cases, I'm not saying that they're not, where the vaccine does not protect individuals, usually people who are immunocompromised, older, or in some cases it happens with normal, people who have no comorbidities, but those people tend to not have severe disease and die. And that is what we're trying to prevent. Okay, so I have, hi, good day, a question from a parent from Mult Moulton Hall School. I myself have been diagnosed at the age of 14 with Guillain barre syndrome, but I've been fully recovered. Knowing that this is an uncommon cold, very rare, and it also has compromised my immune system, can I still be vaccinated? Or should my children as well, I'm more concerned for their well-being, seeing that there isn't enough data on this specific ailment. My kids are, children are perfectly healthy. They do suffer from allergies and they get that from me. Their allergies are from pollens and pollen to snacks. I have to be very careful, alert when they go out, eat. Any related information would be great, greatly appreciated. So this is a mother who has Guillain barre syndrome and she also has children who suffer with allergies. Um, perhaps Dr. Rancharita or anyone on the panel, sorry. Sure. Sure. All right. Guillain-Barre syndrome in the lady does not mean that her children necessarily would have Guillain-Barre syndrome, and it certainly can occur after various viral syndromes. In fact, I was on a radio program the other day, and the lady spoke about her having a severe uh, a form of Guillain-Barre following Zika infection. All right. So what I would say is that her situation does not necessarily translate into the children with the vaccine. What we do know from the United Kingdom data is that Guillain-Barre syndrome has been more often associ been associated, and it's rare, rare, with more of the viral vectors. In the Johnson Johnson situation, Johnson Johnson um, 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 viral vector um, vaccine, they have seen 100 cases in 12 million doses. So that's rare. Um, it has been seen with AstraZeneca. It certainly has been seen far less commonly uh, and in fact, I don't even think that they have uh, suggested that it is a particularly associated with the mRNA um, vaccines. So while one cannot say that vaccines can, uh, vaccines certainly can induce Guillain-Barre syndrome, I think that this, this particular person, this particular lady should, um, should be comforted by the fact that, that her circumstance with a particular virus does not necessarily translate into her children's experience. Um, uh, further than that, as I said, the risk with Pfizer seems to be very small. And, um, and as regards of her, the allergies, the only allergies that really prevent one from not being able to take the vaccines, such as the Pfizer, or the AstraZeneca, are those in which, uh, are the, let's say polyethylene glycol in the case of um, of the, the, in other words, the components within the vaccine. So common allergens, egg allergy, latex allergy, um, pollen allergy are not contraindications to getting the vaccine. Thank you so much, Dr. Montai, for that. So we have Annalisa Stewart. She's saying good, good evening and thank you so much for having this presentation. My son had been born preterm and had serious complications at birth. He's also allergic to penicillin. Penicil penicillin, sorry. Is it safe for him to be vaccinated? We have two people who've been asking about penicillin. Um, I think I addressed that in my talk as well. Um, allergies to drugs, to penicillin, does not prevent you from having the vaccine. Just as Dr. Montai says, it has to be and allergy to the components of the vaccine. Um, and the fact that if a son has been born preterm and has serious complications post-birth, then he's one person that is what we consider the groups that should be vaccinated. Um, because if he does contract the virus, you'd be worried about how his, his response to actually having a virus would be. So yes, it is safe for him to be vaccinated. I want to just emphasize that too, um, in terms of drugs, because we get that question a lot, even with the adults, um, depending on what drugs they take, there are very little, very few drugs that um, would prevent or preempt you um, from taking the vaccine. I mean, you can discuss it with your family physician, but same thing with your pediatrician, but um, they're really very little, if any, except for the allergies. 
we had a question from um, a consultant, pediatric nephrology um, uh, professional. Uh, she's asking, Dr. Nicole Solomon is asking, transplant, ca transplant patients have gotten the approval for a third dose as they are on immunosuppression. Does that mean patients who are on immunosuppression for other conditions also qualify for a third dose? You want um, to see the video? Yeah. So yes, they do. Um, once the solid organ transplant, that level of immunosuppression, once it is that you have conditions that give you that um, equal level of suppression, yes, they do qualify for a booster dose to third dose. Fantastic. Um, I wanted to bring Dr. Sorry, Bandana Sirius Santa Ali back into the conversation. Um, the Children's Authority, what are some of the, the major calls that you all have been getting into the authority during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially since a lot of children, as you mentioned before, are home and we haven't seen a reduction in abuse. So they remain in abusive circumstances. Uh, as it relates specifically to pandemic related concerns, um, I know that we have received calls, particularly from hospital officials, uh, when adults have been uh, contracted the virus and have been quarantined. And so they may liaise with medical social workers who will contact the authority uh, to relay concerns about children who require supervision or alternative placement. Those are, uh, I would say, some of um, the typical calls that we would get that are related to the pandemic specifically. But other than that, the calls that we get relate generally to what we get all other times. So we've continued to get uh, calls as it relates to physical abuse of children um, and sexual abuse continues to be actually when you look at the slide that I had before, uh, neglect, sexual abuse and physical abuse continue to be the leading reports that we get. Uh, for all of our children. So sexual abuse, meaning sexual penetration, sexual touching, uh, we have neglect in all forms. Uh, so not just physical neglect, but now we have a concern for educational neglect as well, because a lot of children lack devices and, and they may not have access to education as well. And then of course, when your basic needs have to be met, Education sometimes falls on the on the sidelines when persons are fighting for food. They don't think about their other higher order needs, as Dr. Gibbs de Pesa was saying. So the, the, the reports are generally the same as we've gotten throughout um, throughout our, our work. And thank you so much for referencing Dr. Gibbs de Pisa. My next question is for her, Dr. Gibbs de Pisa. A lot of teachers had to switch immediately into on school teaching. What are some of the concerns that this has um, brought onto the delivery of education in Trinidad and Tobago? And what has this, how have our children suffered um, as a result, not having the ability to socialize? Okay, thank you for the question. The, in terms of the teachers, the, the shift was so sudden, nothing was put in place. And following on that, when we would have expected that there would have been uh, adequate training <coughs> sessions to assist the teachers, they were just left up to themselves to manage. And obviously that would have a negative effect on the children. In addition to which this causes dissatisfaction, discomfort, and that is transferred from the teacher to the child. In terms of the, the um, devices, we know that there are a lot of children, many, many children in this country who do not have devices and not only children, even university students who do not have devices. We have had several students at the university who cannot attend class because they have to borrow somebody's cell phone or somebody's whatever. They have to go by their family or their cousin or their friend to get um, accessibility. All of these things are happening, not only to the children, but even to the students at university level, right? So 
what is required is, as I said, planned intervention, structured developmental approach. And people have been just, you know, assuming that things will happen. Everybody will get around to it. And we are not getting that structured approach and that planned intervention where we're doing research, we're checking on, on things, we're assigning persons with responsibility for areas to check and to bring in reports and then putting something in place to make the difference. And the same kind of thing is what we are afraid of when the schools reopen, where you'd be going back into schools without policies in place for social distancing, for wearing of the mask, etc. We tend to take education as it will happen. So let it happen. But in this situation, we need to change that approach. Thank you so much, Dr. Gibbs de Pisa. All right, we have a question here from, let me just go up a little bit and get it properly. I just came in because we have a lot of people on our live tonight and we're very, very grateful. So we're getting a lot of questions. Ajay Ramasa is asking if a child who has had Bell's palsy can take the vaccine. So a lot of questions about very specific ailments and they want to know if their children can get the Pfizer vaccine once they are of the appropriate age. Not sure which one of my panels would like to take. Um, I, I think we kind of covered that, Sweeney, in terms of yeah. if there are very little conditions genetically or otherwise that could prevent you from getting the vaccine. Specifically, it's an allergic reaction to components of your vaccines. If you've had a previous condition that has caused you to actually have an anaphylactic reaction, those kinds of things that Dr. Vidya Maraj explained and um, I also mentioned. So um, pretty much, as I said, you can ask specifically your pediatrician in terms of your particular condition. However, nothing genetic. I can speak from the genetic standpoint in terms of chromosomal abnormalities, hereditary diseases, um, really nothing that could prevent your children from being vaccinated um, straight off the bat. So I wanted to bring um, Vandana Sue. Susanka Ali, back into the conversation. Um, what are some of the biggest concerns that we have with the psychological health of our children as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? Because we don't tend to talk about mental health. And of course, most of the questions coming in today have been about physical ailments, children who have specific medical concerns, but we have not been addressing the psychological effects that this pandemic has had, and maybe even the fears that they have of the vaccine. So how do we treat with that? I'd say the, the most significant would be, as, as outlined in my presentation, anxiety, depression, and a, and a degree of trauma. Uh, so, and I say trauma from the perspective of vicarious trauma. So by that, I mean children are living in a fear-filled environment, living in an environment that is filled with adult paranoia, and therefore that also gets internalized. And so we're seeing where children will experience anxiety, a degree of panic as well. And coupled with that is a very real issue of not being able, and when I particularly bring the child protection perspective in, not being able to access interventions in a timely manner. That has been one of the biggest injustices, I think, to our children together, I think, with the impact on the education system. Uh, that has been one of the biggest injustices because so many of our children in our child protection environment and otherwise rely very heavily on various therapeutic services, both public sector and private, and the inability to access those because of the pause that the pandemic, pandemic has brought on, as well as the, in, on a, in the inaccessibility of these programs now because Many people are unemployed and therefore they do not have money to afford these other services, as I said, because basic needs are taking precedence. So because of that, they have not been able to get access to the treatments that they need. And therefore you're seeing a proliferation of the very symptoms that require them to seek treatment. I wanted to also ask you, um, how do we deal with 
the processing of all of this information and maybe perhaps Dr. Gibbs to Pisa can jump in because as a teacher, this is a lot, this is a very unusual time and it's a lot of technical information that people are really struggling to deal with. And we're grateful for panels, panels like this, but how do we process all of this new information and make the best choices for ourselves and our families? Um, I think it's very important to, um, to have an open mind, one. We have all come into this as a new arena, and a lot of it is scary information. But it's very important to approach it with an open mind, with the perspective of making a personally and socially responsible decision. And to do that, we need to let go of biases, let go of preconceived notions, and listen to the, the advice and the research, and, and you know, take all perspectives on board. I think that is one perspective. The second thing is finding sounding boards that are informed to be able to relay your concerns to. And I say informed because there is a lot of misinformation and a lot of myths uh, and a lot of old wives tales that are being um, perpetuated surrounding this virus. So where there are questions that are causing a lot of anxiety, um, people ought to find uh, workshops like this and other similar forums to be able to have their questions answered. And of course, when it becomes too much to also recognize when you are not coping well and when you need to take a break, self-care, sometimes switch off from the uh, too much news, you know, can be very traumatizing, very triggering and take a break from all of that and engage in some coping resources so that you are better replenished to be able to be present for your child and for others. And, and, and of course, to add to that, we need to recognize that a lot of the people who need this information will not go looking for it. And therefore, within the education system, the health system, we need to have more webinars, panels, discussions, and to have them not just on a national basis, but for instance, in the various school areas, if the, the Ministry of Education would, you know, or whichever agency, even the, 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 um, the, the other, the child health agencies, organize things that would happen, you know, long ago, when we had community centers. So we would have lectures and, and meetings in the community centers so that parents and children can come out and, and get gain something. We need to get back to that community activity because nobody's going to, 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 to leave, as we said, if they have their basic needs to meet, they're not going to leave that or to spend time or money on getting proper information because that's not, that, that, that's higher up the level than, than they have um, requirements for. So that we have the responsibility then to organize within the, the education districts, within the various communities and villages, sem seminars, webinars, whatever we want to call them, where parents and, and, and teachers can participate in discussions that are meaningful and are well informed. That's a responsibility that we have. Sorry, there's a delay there because I'm toggling through so many of um, pages. Uh, Dr. Vidya Ramcharita Maharaj, how have your colleagues um, at the hospital been coping, dealing with uh, the normal healthcare system and a parallel healthcare system, especially under the pandemic? Because we've seen a lot of reports of doctors in other places uh, really struggling where persons aren't being vaccinated. And I wanted to bring that conversation, that, that, that perspective into the conversation as a, another motivator for getting vaccinated, for caring about our healthcare professionals who are very much stretched. Thank you. Um... One of the things that I mean, part of the board systems um, is that we have to be mindful and we treat everyone as possible um, that they may have a COVID infection. 
with my staff, to my my medical staff at the Peds Emergency is almost 95% vaccinated. That's the, the doctors, those that are not, um, they were pregnant, they are pregnant, um, breastfeeding. And those that delivered within the next week were had their vaccines. Um, we, even on my nursing staff has come on board and they have been vaccinated as well. Part of it is that we have had some of our own colleagues who have been vaccinated and have come down with COVID. And we've had to deal with that. And some of it has been long COVID. Uh, what we have found is the support that pediatric emergency gives, and this comes from our top levels. Um, the consultant body very much recognizes it can be very stressful and, and strained on the doctors. Because remember, a lot of us in our system, we live at home. We live with our parents. Um, and some of them were so concerned about their elderly parents that they were renting. During this, uh, the high levels of the pandemic, just to, to, to protect their parents. So just as how we look at physical, we also look at the mental health. So we actually had seminars for our doctors and ensure that each of us knows our staff really well. I can pick up on my staff when I know they're not, they're not acting or behaving as they normally would or something's wrong or in their work ethic. And that usually gives us a clue and then we'll pull them in and each of them have a different person that they will be more comfortable with and we will talk with them and give them that extra support. The fact is, is that the more people are unvaccinated, even though we wear our PPE and everything in hospital, when we go out and join public as well, we will still be exposed. And a lot of times they will contract it from just being around other persons who are unvaccinated. So when our numbers start falling and with if the Delta, the Delta is as contagious as it is, you will have where um, my staff would get infected and then that will affect how much frontline workers you actually have to deal with the pandemic. Um, and that's why we are pushing so much for vaccinations to help reduce the load coming into hospital and reduce the load that will need to have ventilators. Because if we don't get the vaccination programs off and aboard, we will end up having more people requiring HD and ICU settings. And thankfully, um, I can let you guys know that for the North Central Regional Health Authority, we actually vaccinated 1,050 um, of the adolescents today. So that was an achievement and um, we're looking forward to see how it pans for the rest of the days. That's great so news, Dr. Ramjan. <laughs> I wanted to end with Dr. Ramlachan and Dr. Montai. We, all of a sudden, your specific specialties are under the spotlight, but it's very complex. What is the one thing you want everyone to know about vaccines and these vaccines in particular? Michelle, you wanna go first? I would actually like to answer a question that's on the chat, if you don't mind. Oh, for the question sure. is, um, does, thank you, would the panel mind to comment on the future potential for autoimmunity with mRNA vaccine technology? I want to put forward that the chances of developing, and what do we mean by autoimmunity? We mean that the body now is attacking part of the self. So what this person is actually saying is, if we get the mRNA vaccine, and we uh, mRNA is the, the spike for the spike protein, the cells turn on the spike protein, and we make a response to the spike protein, will we also make a response to perhaps something the spike protein is overlaps with in the, in the self, and that we will continue to attack the self? I would argue that if you are responding to the spike protein in that way, your chances of developing autoimmunity will be greater if you get COVID. Because when you get a virus that enters a cell and is making thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of virions and attacking more of your body, you have a huge amount more spike protein. And therefore, you have more possibility if there is cross-reactivity with any cell tissue for autoimmunity after the infection. I also want to say that autoimmunity in the greater scheme of things is really a relatively rare thing. 
You need a perfect storm to have autoimmunity. You need to have a genetic predisposition. You need to have breakdown in what we call levels of tolerance. And you need to have the virus or if, in the, if, if the person wants to suggest the vaccine. And I would say that in the scheme of infections in the world, that autoimmunity does exist. We do know that it could be linked to uh, infections. You could get autoimmunity after EBV, you know, epstein barr or various infections. And, 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 and so it does. So I will argue once again that while it's possible, you have a greater chance of, um, of autoimmunity after COVID-19 infection. So if I have to take the choice, take your vaccine. I think that's a beautiful way to end it. Dr. Amla Chan, any last thing? Um, um, just wanted to say thank you so much um, for the panelists um, for agreeing to do this with us and providing their fantastic expertise. I would like to, um, of course, um, echo um, what Dr. Wanta is saying. Um, also too, I would like to say as a geneticist that you know the, the chance of that occurring is almost nil. Right. Um, just generally, I know she's she was she was taking the high road and saying, well, if it occurs, this will, will happen. But it's much more. I mean, it would be vaccine. It's much more um, a risk with with COVID infection um, than it ever would from any any um, any vaccine. It's almost nil um, for, for that particular thing occur, as is the the the, it, the um, constant argument about deaths, deaths due to vaccine, deaths due to COVID. I mean, it's clear if we look at the number of deaths around the world um, that it is due to COVID-19 infection. We're not seeing deaths because of vaccination at anywhere near close to those levels. And I, I keep emphasizing that point. We have over 4.87 billion vaccines in arms as of today's date, as of the 18th of August, 2021. If vaccines were killing people, we would see you know, literally, literally truckloads or morgues filled with people who were post-vaccinated, and that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing the morgues and the truckloads and the, and the freezer-filled bodies that we were seeing in the early days, and we've seen in some countries now, we're seeing all those pariahs burning in India a few months ago with COVID-infected people who did not survive because of COVID-19 infection. So I want to just emphasize that you have to be very aware of the data that you are processing. There is misinformation everywhere. And please, please, please come to us. We are all available. Everybody has made themselves available today at extended time. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you, panelists. You know, bellies probably growling, children probably quarreling, husbands probably, you know, waiting for their food and wives waiting to be fed by husbands and partners. So um, thanks again for, for joining us. And I would like to just leave one, um, you know, one anecdote with our viewers to say, be careful, you know, buyer beware when it comes to what you listen to and what you, you know, continue to, to spread. Um, try to let it be factual. The, I, I pulled out the WHO websites during my presentation for people to know that data is there. Go on the websites, find it. It's not a secret. Go to Sage. They're the ones who are paid by us big money to be able to do this kind of stuff for you. You don't have to do that kind of analysis of all these different so-called experts. We are saying that these guys have the facts, they have the information. Um, get your answers from people who are qualified and make your decisions. The risks are there, yes. Um, they, again, there's always risk when it is you're introducing anything into your body that is foreign, anything into your child that's foreign. However, that risk is there with aspirin, it's risk with drinking water. As, as, our, as our Prime Minister says, it's there with honey goat weed, it's there. So you have to, you know, be able to educate yourself on, on really that risk versus benefit and ask people, ask people who know better, right? Thanks. And thanks again for UTT for allowing us to do this. And, and, and thanks again for all the viewers who are, are there listening. Yes, thank you so much to our panel, Mrs. Vandana Susanka, Dr. Nisha Montai, Dr. Vidya Ramcharita Maharaj, Dr. Nicole Ramnachan, Dr. Hazel Gibbs de Pisa. Thank you so much. This conversation will be on the UTT's YouTube channel that you will be able to view at On Demand anytime you want to. Join us again next week where the conversation will be on mandatory vaccines. So far we have Douglas Ment, SC, Cohen Garcia, who's a labor lawyer um, and the president of UTT, Prakash Prasad, and again, Dr. Nicole Ramnachan to be discussing the issue of mandatory vaccines. Thank you so much for joining us. 
uh, today and 